Maybe the SmackDown talent should be stranded out of the country more often. I'm not saying, but I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? Because this week's SmackDown most certainly had a different feeling to it compared to the previous couple of weeks. And I gotta say that it showed, you could feel it. And maybe some of it was just due to the fact of the company really couldn't plan out what they were gonna do because they didn't know who the hell they were gonna have. So it was a little more fly by the seat of your pants and it might not be the show you plan for, but it's the show you got and sometimes that's not the worst thing in the world. Because the show definitely had a different feeling to it. Now look, I most certainly am not one of those NXT diehards that lives for everything that Adam Cole and everybody else does. Ah! I don't really watch that show. But if you're trying to tie into Survivor Series, this is a good initial salvo to doing that. As there was a feeling of kind of unpredictability and spontaneity that we so often do not get from WWE specifically and kind of wrestling overall as a whole. So this worked. Not surprising to me that Brock was one of the ones that was able to get the hell out of Saudi Arabia at a decent time and make it to SmackDown. And here comes Brock Lesnar, Paul Heyman, Paul Heyman cutting the same basic standard lather, rinse, repeat promo that you've seen for a, a number of years now. What was fascinating to me was the match between him and Cain Velasquez at Crown Jewel was so short that they showed the whole damn match here in the opening segment of SmackDown. They showed the whole damn two-minute match. Whole damn two-minute match. And, and you know what's crazy about it is now that I've actually seen the match, because I refused to watch Crown Jewel, but it was put here as part of the SmackDown, so I'm like, might as well pay attention for the two minutes that it's going to take for this to be over with. Yeah, that was really bad. I don't necessarily have a gripe about the fight, the match, being just over two minutes. But the fact that they largely danced around and there wasn't a lot of high-impact stuff and then it was basically Bob's your uncle, it's over. You know, to me, it was just kind of stupid, frankly. Well, what are you going to do? It's clearly sending a message to Cain Velasquez that if you're going to be here, you're going to play ball, and you're going to play by our rules. Got to make sure you pad Brock's ego, too. Uh, whatever. But nonetheless, Brock apparently is quitting SmackDown, even though he was drafted to SmackDown, because I'm not sure this is the way that any of this works. And he's going to go after Rey Mysterio, who Rey hit him with a bunch of chair shots at Crown Jewel. So he's going to go on to Monday Night Raw, and he's going to find Rey Mysterio. So this is the whole thing, like, the SmackDown people are contracted to SmackDown, can't appear on Raw, da 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 So now guys just randomly quit and go to the other show? Like I said, is this how any of this works? Is it? Is it? I don't know. The SmackDown Women's Championship match... You know, seeing Bailey as a heel is just, if nothing else, it's palate cleansing for after so long of being in one direction. Now she's clearly in the other. It's kind of ironic to see Sasha Banks kind of playing her backup bitch at this point, and that's exactly what the hell she pretty much is. Weird that in this important championship match that Nikki Cross goes out there, but Alexa Bliss isn't there. And where was she? That was just kind of weird. Uh, but this match ultimately comes down to Sure, Bailey retains or whatever, but it's Shayna Baszler making her grand debut on SmackDown. And while I would say, yeah, let's get all excited about the top woman from the brand that just got barely over 500,000 viewers this week against the World Series in NXT by debuting her on the show that last week drew under 900,000 viewers on FS1 and SmackDown. So yeah, let's get all giggly tits about that. Hooray! This was a really impactful way to debut her. Like, this is the way you do a good debut. And this certainly was a good debut. As it was, too, with Matt Riddle and Keith Lee. Like, as Taxi Stan is talking trash about these NXT people on the mic backstage, here comes the bro, Matt Riddle, and here comes freaking Big Bear Keith Lee. And I'm just sitting there looking at Keith Lee. I'm like, that's a big mother humper. 
Like literally a big mother humper compared to these other two guys. Like that instantly stands out to you and is like, holy cow. Can't wait to see how Vince turns him into a gay dancing bear down the road, but we'll get there when we cross that rainbow bridge. Um, but when they eventually chase Taxi Stan out to the ring area and they do their thing, I don't know if I'm huge on Matt Riddle wearing the flip-flops and going around barefoot or not. Again, I really don't watch NXT that much, so my exposure to these guys is very, very limited. So keep that in mind. But then you see Keith Lee doing this big fucking move off of the top turnbuckle, or excuse me, off the middle rope, and you're like, man, that's really special when a dude that big can do something like that. This is a really, really good featuring of these two guys from NXT on SmackDown, just like it was with Tommaso Ciampa being the guest on Miz TV because The Fiend wasn't going to be there, and Tommaso Ciampa's out there, and, and it just... You know, Ciampa's all right with me in my book. Like, he's, he's a decent, decent, decent talent. And he's not a megastar or anything, but he's a decent talent. He's a talent that I would want in my company for sure. And then he goes out there and he has a match with The Miz, and he ends up beating The Miz in an adequate match. You know, so if you're trying to introduce Tommaso Ciampa to a larger audience than what watches him on NXT, it most certainly was a good showcase right there in the middle of the show for him, and that's how it should be done. The one thing that aggravated me the most about this show, though, the most about this show, is here you have God and Shawn Michaels and Daniel Bryan. Like, this is just screaming out, Breakfast Club Business! Breakfast Club Business! So been the three of them in a triple threat in the fucking main event of the show. I appreciated the tease they did with Shawn Michaels taking off the shirt and getting ready to flex, and I ain't happened it. You thought you were going to get HBK. You thought you were going to get God himself, Triple H, hunger, taking on Daniel Bryan, the Breakfast Club killer. No, no, no. It's going to be Adam Cole, baby. And you want to talk about letdowns and disappointments. That was one of them. No offense to Adam Cole or you baby fans, but let's be real here. Breakfast Club business is on an entirely different level. And here was a night that I could have been got given it. This was a night that I could have had it. But no, we had to sit there and say survivor series. And we had to sit there and push the NXT guys. And who gives a crap? Who gives a crap about stories or anything else when you're the Breakfast Club? It's horrible. Horrible. And a grave, fundamental, rudimentary fucking abomination of justice. So before he got to the main event, that wasn't the main event that it should have been. He had Tegan Knox and Rhea Ripley taking on Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville in a women's tag match. I believe they misspelled uh, Tegan Knox's name on the graphics, but what do I know? Um, all I remember is I think Rhea Ripley looked pretty impressive in terms of some of the moves that she did. So that's something. At least I remember that. Not really much else. The NXT Championship match. This is kind of novel. Daniel Bryan taking on Adam Cole. You know, I look, I look at this match and I say, you know, this is something that I would have rather have seen Daniel Bryan go to NXT and have that match to kind of build up and boost up that NXT brand a little bit. But instead, it happened here on SmackDown. I don't necessarily like that all the main roster SmackDown guys on a show that gets three times the viewership in the case now think about it this way. SmackDown this week ended up getting just over 2.5 million viewers, up from two weeks ago in the 2.4 million viewer number. And I think that was a reflection in part of, there's a little bit of spontaneity. You had new people debuting, a little more interest. Um, so that was a good thing. Sustainable, no, but for this particular week, it wasn't that bad. But you're going to take the guy who is the world champ on the brand who this week on Wednesday got just over 500,000 viewers, and have him beat the guy that is a relatively known guy on a show that does 2.5 million viewers. Some of you could say that's how you leverage experience to get over the new, fresher faces, and I don't dispute that. But if you're going to have NXT look so strong across the board, even then it starts to lose its appeal and its impact a little bit. But if it was doing all of this to set up 
to the real main event of this show, which is all the NXT talent out there taking their rightful position behind God as God hug. Cut a promo log of talking about, you want a war? You got a war! It's magnificent. And all that almost 50-year-old ego and arrogance and self-belief. Well, you can feel it. You can sense it. And it leave, left you wanting more, more, more on everything that was the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley. And it's an amazing and a magnificent thing. Even more amazing than and magnificent than Vince McMahon being the captain of the ship and making sure he left half his damn talent. Mm. Oh, I don't give a crap about you. I'm getting the fuck out of Saudi Arabia myself. I've already collected the money. <laughs> the even more impressive miracles on a night like this. On a night like this. Where all these NXT talents got their moment in the sun, got their spotlight on network television. When it all comes to pass, and when all is said and done, Tommaso Ciampa beating The Miz, it's child's play. Ciampa looking across the ring when God is in front of him, staring down Adam Cole in the title. The little things matter, yes, but it is insignificant. Adam Cole beating Daniel Bryan to retain the NXT Championship. Sure, you indie nerds and hardcore fans can love it up, and love it up if you must, but it is all ham and egg or potato crap compared to the real thing that mattered. The magnificence of the miracle. That is, with all that went on this show and the NXT invasion, it all still came back to Triple H to close out the night. Now, while some of you may believe in higher powers and gods that you can't see, that you believe in, here is something you can see, something you can quantify. A man, an immortal man at that, but a man nonetheless, that makes miracles happen that you can see, feel, hear, touch. With all that went on in the night, it was still about him, and that's magnificent. Now that is ego that I can get behind. That is next level arrogance that just so many people can't understand in this world. And I love it. I absolutely love it. I'm sure some of you are going to sit there and say, Well, you stop cribbing on her too. We love Smackdown this week. And her goal is awesome, baby. Still don't get what is so particularly special about Adam Cole. But whatever. But you find your things to enjoy about a show. That's your business. That's your deal. I did enjoy Smackdown this week. Quite a bit, actually. I just do it in my own way. And that is okay. For one week it worked. I like the spontaneity. I like the different type of feeling of it. No, I don't want this show to be an NXT showcase the next few weeks because why the hell would I want to bring people over from the floundering brand on Wednesday night? Just saying. But nonetheless, I did enjoy this quite a bit. So, well done, WWE. You managed to shine up the shit and do something halfway decent with it this week.